Hello everyone and welcome to the channel, I'm Emmanuel, I'm a Boeing 737 pilot and a member of PMDG's tech team. Today let's have a look at the heads-up display in the PMDG Boeing 737 in Microsoft Flight Simulator. First things first though, I am not actually certified to fly with heads-up displays as my airline is not using them. So that means that all the information in this video comes from several different real-life manuals and from talking to real-life pilots who have actually used the heads-up display. So, first of all, we need to have a look at what is the big advantage of the heads-up display. Well, it provides us with two different sorts of information that are not available anywhere else in the 737 cockpit. The first one of them is the flight path symbol, or as engineers would call it, the velocity vector. That is the one you see right in the middle on the screen there, and it is the symbol telling you exactly where your airplane is going. The second one is the flight path acceleration symbol, which is that little chevron you see on the left of the flight path symbol that tells you how your total energy state is developing. Those two pieces of equipment are not available anywhere else in the Boeing 737 cockpit, so they make usage of the heads-up display special. But let's start a little bit earlier. Why exactly do we need heads-up displays, then what is the primary purpose of this instrument? Well, the primary purpose of it is to enable operation in low visibility conditions that are even worse than what the airplane is certified for with the standard CAT3A certification. Now, that is also the reason why most of the training manuals that are available for the HUD actually focus on low visibility operation. However, it is encouraged by pretty much any airline that has the heads-up display installed to actually use it in any situation of flight because it greatly enhances situational awareness. Now, let's start with the basics though. What are the primary components of the heads-up display? And for this we're going to change right over into the flight simulator. And the first one we have is up here on the overhead. And this is simply called the overhead unit. From there we move forward towards the combiner, which is the unit that the pilot sees through. Then we have the control panel, which is located on the pedestal and is that little unit down here. And finally we have the annunciator that is located on the first officer's side down here. We also have a fifth unit which is the computer running the entire thing which is located in the E&E bay. However since that is not really relevant for our flight simulator operation we are going to ignore it for now. The heads up display itself comes with a couple different modes of operation. So let's have a look into those. And we start all the way up here with the primary mode. The primary mode is a mode that can pretty much be used for any kind of operation, including the low visibility takeoff. Now, looking at the table that we have on screen over here, the rightmost part of it is a very interesting one. And that is where the source of the guidance on the heads-up display actually comes from. And anything labeled EDFCS means the information comes from the airplane's computers, while anything that has the heads-up guidance system as guidance source listed means that the heads-up display is actually doing its own computations, thereby giving you an almost independent source of information in your cockpit. I say almost independent because the data still comes from the same raw data sources as the same nav radios and the same sensors. However, all the computation is independent of what is going on in the aircraft's computers, meaning that you have an almost independent source of information there. So, let's have a look into the different modes that are available in the heads-up display. We have the primary mode, which is used mostly during takeoff, climb, en route, descent, approach and landing phases, and during the low visibility takeoff. Then we have the head-up displays A3 approach mode, which is used during ILS approach and landing, and we have the rollout mode, which is used for rollout guidance. Then there is IMC and VMC modes, but don't let the names of those modes fool you. 
The IMC mode is used for any autopilot or flight director approach because it will show you the raw data of, for example, the ILS or the VOR, whatever is currently tuned active. So the IMC mode is basically used for any instrument approach, be it an ILS, VOR, NDB, whatever it is. The VMC mode is only used for visual approaches because it will remove any of those raw navigation data from your view. So, that is the different modes that the head-up display has. Now, let's have a quick look into the flight crew operations manual to see what kind of information that actually is and what that looks like. We start over here with the head-up display primary mode. So let's zoom this one in a little bit that we can see it a bit better. And this is what the primary mode looks like. This is more or less a replication of the primary flight display. However, there are a couple changes there that we should be aware of. I will talk about the particular indications and features that are different from the primary flight display a little bit later on, after we had a look at the different other modes available. The next one is going to be the IMC mode, and we can find IMC mode a little bit further down in the manual. And here it is. As we can see, the IMC mode is a little bit more decluttered compared to the standard primary mode. Now, this helps us with the view outside, while at the same point in time maintaining all the relevant information that we need for our flight. Now, as said, this is the mode that is used in any instrument approach, except for ILS. Now, let's go a little bit further down and have a look at the A3 mode, which is the mode that is used for ILS approaches. And this is what the A3 mode looks like. The difference between IMC and A3 mode is that in A3 mode, we get the runway symbol drawn up here on the display. Now, for completeness, let's also have a look into the VMC mode, which we can see down here. Now, in the VMC mode, there is basically similar information shown to the IMC mode, with the exception that the raw data information has been removed. And if you're wondering what this is, this is just added for um, the sake of the manual. This is TCAS information, so you can uh, think away those. Now, as I told you earlier, there is quite a bit of um, symbology that we should be aware of. And in this video, let's just talk about the most important parts of information that we have. Now, looking at the heads-up display, the majority of information is the same as it is on the primary flight display. So what we are going to look like mostly over here is the flight path symbol, the acceleration symbol and the total energy status because these are really the most important things we have on the heads-up display. So let's go a little bit further into the manual and have a look into the relevant section. So over here we have all the heads-up guidance information explained so I'm just going to scroll through this, pause the video and read whatever you believe is interesting to you but I'm going to point out the, in my opinion, really important pieces of information here so um, that we can discuss those. And here we start with the flight path symbol. So, the flight path symbol displays the actual flight path vector of the aircraft and it has display priority over all other symbols except the guidance queue and the flare command. So, this symbol looks very similar to the uh, flight path vector and indeed it more or less serves the same function, however, that it is overlaid over the terrain. Remember the um, picture we had from the first place, so it shows you exactly where your airplane is going. Now let's go a little bit further in the manual, and here is the next important piece of information, which is the flight path acceleration symbol, that is this little symbol on the left hand side over here that you will see next to the flight path um, vector. And this is positioned left of the flight path vector and indicates the sum of all the forces affecting the airplane, including thrust, drag and wind. If it's positioned above the flight path vector, the airplane is accelerating. If it's positioned below the flight path vector, the airplane is decelerating. 
It is removed from display when a decreasing performance low level wind shear is detected below 400 feet. However, here's the important thing how you can use this when you're using the heads up display. With the flight path acceleration symbol being directly next to that um, wing of the flight path symbol, you basically are in an unaccelerated energy state, maintaining the speed that you previously had. Now, if this symbol is higher than the wing, it will be accelerating. If the symbol is lower, your airplane is decelerating and losing total energy. Let's go a little bit further down in the important pieces of information because there is one more relating to this that we have to have a look at over here. And that is right here, the speed error tape. Now the speed error tape displays the difference between the indicated airspeed and the reference speed selected on the mode control panel or in the flight management computer just to add to that. The tape length equals the diameter of the um, flight path circle when it represents approximately 5 knots of airspeed error. The maximum tape length is limited to 15 knots of error. So if we have a look at the display on the approach on the right hand side there, we can see that the speed error tape is indicating a tiny bit below the um, circle. And this means that we are currently a tiny bit slower than the recommended or than the MCP selected speed. Now, the selected speed in the picture is VREF plus 5 and the speed error tape is a tiny bit below the circle. That means we're probably flying VREF minus 1 or, or sorry, VREF plus 5 minus 1. So MCP speed minus 1 or maybe minus 2 in the picture that we see up there. Together with that, if we have a look in the acceleration symbol once again into the uh, flight path acceleration then you will see that it is actually slightly below the wing so in the picture that we see right now we are about a knot or two slower than the recommended speed set on the MCP and we are slowly decelerating so this would be a good indication for us that we need to add a little bit of thrust and that is the most important symbology on the heads-up display but Let's quickly go over a couple other interesting symbols that we can see on the picture over there. One of them is the pitch limit indicator, also called angle of attack limit. Now, you'll see this just above the horizon at about maybe 2 or 3 degrees of pitch in the picture shown. And this would be the pitch angle to which you need to pull the nose of the aircraft in order to activate the stick shaker. Now, going a little bit further down, we are going to have the tail strike pitch limit. Now, this is not shown in the picture above since we are on approach, but it basically represents this little line that you see up here. And this is important on takeoff, as you don't want to put your airplane symbol that you see down here into that line, otherwise you are going to have a tail strike. But this is going to be detailed in greater detail on the separate approach video. So, apart from that, we have a little dot, which is the Flight Director Guidance Queue, which is not displayed on the right-hand side, by the way, because the HUD is in visual approach mode on the picture that we see on the right. Another important symbol up here is the TOGA Pitch Target Line. Now, this is displayed when you are taking off using the heads-up display, and this is a little dashed line that you are going to see in your attitude scale and it represents the line to which you should pitch the aircraft after takeoff. Now, there are two more symbols that we need to look at. The first is the A3 flare command and the second is the flare cues. Now, why are these different? Quite simple. The A3 flare command is used in A3 approach mode, so basically on ILS approaches, and it tells you how to flare the airplane. So, to go by the explanation of the manual, the symbol flashes for one second and rises towards the guidance queue at a rate proportional to the expected flare pitch rate. At an altitude of between 45 and 55 feet, the flare command and guidance queue meet and continue rising to command the flare maneuver until touchdown. In contrary to the A3 flare command, we also have the flare cues, which show with the heads-up display in 
primary mode in flight and an IMC and VMC mode. And they are displayed on each side of the flight path symbol, indicating the flare maneuver must be accomplished. The queue flashes continuously as the airplane descends through 55 feet radio altitude until 10 feet radio altitude is reached. So the difference between the two is the A3 flare command actually commands the flare maneuver, while the flare cues tell you that you have to flare the airplane yourself. So, now that we had a look at the symbology, let's go ahead and go into the simulator to have a look at how to configure the heads-up display for our use. And here we are, right back in our aircraft at Cologne Bonn Airport. Now, we can see in the default point of view that PMDG has set, the entire HUD symbology is a little bit to the left, so it is a good idea to move the viewpoint just a tiny bit to the right to get it back into the middle of the heads-up display. Be aware that the guidance we see in front over here is always going to remain steady in position as your point of view moves around. So, in order to see properly on the heads-up display, you need to be in a good seating position. The important thing when configuring the heads-up display for your use is that you set it to a brightness level that is in line with what you have outside. So right now the heads-up display is rather bright and it actually blocks everything behind of it from view. Like you can see up here on that um, 5000 foot selected altitude. Now. We don't want that. We want the heads-up display to be at a brightness level where you can actually look through the indications. So going up here on the combiner we have the hot brightness knob and unfortunately the auto setting, which is what I've just went into right now, is not very good on this one because it is impossible to measure the level of brightness inside Microsoft Flight Simulator. So we actually have to go to the manual mode by pressing the hot brightness button in and then we turn it down all the way until we're able to look through the display. So for example what we have right now would be a good level of indication. Be aware however of the different level of brightness for example of the sky and of the ground so you don't want to change this immediately after rotation so maybe put it a bit brighter like we have it on screen right now. The primary and all other modes can easily be accessed from the panel that we have down here on the pedestal. So let's have a quick look at the panel down here as well. We have four functional buttons on the left hand side and then we have our indicator in the middle and the uh, numeric keypad on the right hand side with the plus minus and clear buttons below. The mode shown on the upper side of the display is the currently active mode. So currently we are in primary mode. The mode shown on the second line is the standby mode, which currently is IMC. Now, the way this works is when you want to change your mode, let's say currently we are in primary mode, but let's say that we wanted to go to VMC mode. Then we use the standby button until the mode that we want to go into is shown in the second line down here in the control panel. And when the second line indicates the mode that we want to change to, we press the mode button and that now becomes the active mode. And if we head over to our pilot seat, then we can see that VMC mode is now the active mode in the heads-up display. Now, remember the table that I showed you earlier on that basically told us which modes to use? Well, keep that one in mind because it will tell you exactly which mode to use in which situation. So for takeoff, we actually want to be in primary mode. So let's change this one back. To primary by clicking the mode button once again. Now, right now A3 armed is the standby mode and as you can see we can easily toggle between the different modes using the standby key. Next up is the runway key. If we press the runway button then we now see, are able to change the runway length in the heads-up display computer and you need to adjust this length to what you actually want to use. So right now we are standing at Cologne Bonn Airport, intersection Alpha 5 for runway 14 left. And the takeoff run available from this point is 3875, sorry, it's um, 3587 feet. So since we've pressed the runway button once 
already. We see runway length in meters. And now we can simply type the new length. So let's go 3587, press enter. And now the unit indication has been removed, indicating to us that we have the runway length put into the computer. If we click the runway button a second time, it is going to bring us towards the airport elevation. This also needs to be programmed by the pilot. And I did this already in the past because we've got 302 feet shown over here, which is the published altitude of Cologne Bonn Airport. Pressing the button once again, we, you can cycle between the different modes of input. And if we just press enter, then we go back into the standard view over here. The last function we have down here on the heads up guidance and control panel is the glide slope mode. Now this mode basically needs to be programmed for the expected approach angle at any point in time. Now, I say expected approach angle and not glide slope because you would program it for any approach that you would do. Now, I've currently set it to minus 3, which is the standard 3 degree glide path, and I'm going to leave it at this. The last part that we have in the cockpit over here is what we have in front of the first officer on the side over here, which is the annunciator. Now, the annunciator can be checked together with the standard light test. So let's put that on for a second. And this is all the indications that we have up here. Now, I could of course go ahead and explain you exactly what that means. But I believe it is going to be a little bit easier just to show you right from the FCOM without explaining any of those things myself. So let's open the FCOM once more and have a look at the page that explains everything we need to know about this panel, which is right here. So down here you have a list of all the different modes that you can see on the um, annunciator panel. And if you are wondering, just pause the video for a second and read through what all of these messages mean. Also, if we go to the second page, we'll have the um, HGS fail light explained, but that is pretty much self-explanatory as well, as we can see up here in the explanation. So, this shall conclude today's video on the introduction of the heads-up display. I am going to release separate videos, one by one, covering takeoff, cruise, and then later on approach operation in all the different modes because doing all of that in a single video would just be too much. For now, thank you very much for watching. If you want to support the channel, you can do so either by becoming a channel member. You are going to find the link in the video description below and that is going to give you early access to a lot of um, pre-released videos. And in first class membership, you even have the ability to request your own information and videos. But if you don't want to become a channel member, you can always support me either through the Buy Me Coffee link in the video description below or simply by liking, commenting and sharing the video as that does also really help out the channel. Thank you very much for watching and I'm looking forward to see you all again very soon.